John Milton's poem, Lycidas, is one of the most beautiful poems we have in English. Praised throughout the centuries, it's remained one of the, the greatest English elegies that we have. Mark Pattison calls it the high watermark of English poesy. It's a bit difficult for modern readers to read because of all of the classical references, but I want to show in this close reading how, even if you don't know the classical references, you can still see and understand and experience this poem as a truly great poem and a work of art. This poem is an elegy, which is a type of poem that commemorates someone who is dead. Most elegies are preoccupied with this absence of the person. Tennyson's In Memoriam is a great example. The absence of Hallam is always there. In this case, for the poem Lycidas, the body of Lycidas is absent, and his absence is particularly vexing, not only to uh, the speaker, but those who appear in the poem, and also those in England, Edward King's family. Now, Lycidas is the classical nickname that John Milton gives the actual colleague of his that died, Edward King. Edward King was a fellow student of Milton's at Cambridge, and he died in 1637 on the Irish seas, so his body was never recovered. And so this absence, of course, has this strange presence within the poem, and the poem partly seeks to resolve not just the absence of of Edward King in his death, but also the absence of, of even a body left behind. So Edward King died in 1637 in August. John Milton writes this poem somewhere around November of the same year. His poem is about time and space. Uh, uh, it's, it's so interested in uh, sifting between what is temporal, what can be shaken out, and what will remain, and what is eternal. And part of that shaking experience, that sifting, as it were, is deeply involved in the Christian presence here, which appears occasionally throughout the poem, but often predominantly when it does. Notice how the elegiac speaker begins here with this speech act of address. Yet once more, O ye laurels, and once more, ye myrtles brown, with ivy never sear, I come to pluck your berries harsh and crude and with forced fingers rude shatter your leaves before the mellowing year. Addressing the laurels, the branches that were used to crown the victors uh, or commemorate the poets, the speaker apologetically says, once more I come to pluck the berries harsh and crude. Of course, the berries are crude, unripe, and with fingers rude, harsh, or unskilled, uh, unlearned. So we have a, a kind of uh, intimation of who the speaker is. The, sh the speaker will learn is a shepherd character who knew Lycidas well. Again, we're in the, the world of the classical pastoral. Amidst this, we have this very subtle Christian allusion which harkens back to Hebrews, book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 26, when the author of the epistle says that yet once more the Lord will come to shake not just the earth but also the heaven. And in the context of that passage, there's this shaking, this apocalyptic, eschatological shaking that's going on, that's going to sift the things that will remain from the things that will fall away. And even though this is such a subtle, in some ways tenuous, allusion to Hebrews, this poem is involved in exactly that process of sifting what is true and what will remain, what is immutable, and what will fall away. He's come to shatter or scatter your leaves before the mellowing year. Bitter constraint and sad occasion dear compels me to disturb your season due. So addressing the laurels as though they're inquiring, why are you coming to pick the berries that are unripe with rude fingers? Why do you scatter our leaves? Bitter constraint a sad occasion compels me to disturb your season. Why? For Lycidas is dead. Dead ere his prime. Notice this repetition, this apanalepsis here, the beginning of a phrase with the same word that ends the prior phrase. Dead, dead ere his prime. This repetition of Lycidas, of course, the repetition of the name is important in the elegy because it's calling up the presence that is absent. For Lycidas is dead, dead ere his prime, young Lycidas, and hath not left his peer. Peer meaning equal. He was unequaled. He is left, and there's no one like him to fill 
the void. And this is very much within the human experience of grief when one uh, has the occasion of losing one that one loves and uh, there's nothing that can fill the void hath not left his peer. Who would not sing for Lycidas? He knew himself to sing and build the lofty rhyme. He must not float upon the watery bier unwept and welter to the parching wind without the meed of some melodious tear. Just beautiful musicality here. And you'll notice that the rhyme scheme is varied as it is throughout the entire poem. No verse paragraph is quite the same in its rhyme scheme. You notice we have this image at the beginning of Lycidas floating upon the watery bier unwept. Um, he must not go unwept. The speaker is calling upon himself to sink. He has to. There's this moral constraint, this obligation. Who would not sing for Lycidas? He must not go unwept. Welter meaning to, to, to writhe or, or to, to be tossed about by the parching wind. And of course, Lycidas right now, this image of him that the speaker is imagining is atop the waves. But towards the end of the poem, we're going to be thinking about Lycidas dead at the bottom of the ocean. Um, but here is perhaps the imagined act of dying. He was upon the waters, clinging perhaps to something floating before he died. So he won't go without the reward or meed of some melodious tear. Begin then. Here comes another address. We've, we've addressed the laurels. We're going to see this poem is full of addresses. Begin then, sisters of the sacred well. That's the muses. So we have this invocation of the muse. Begin then. Sisters of the sacred well, that from beneath the seat of Jove doth spring. We have allusion to the classical god Jove. Begin, and somewhat loudly sweep the string, hence with denial vain, and coy excuse. Do not offer an excuse not to sing. You must come, you must come aid this song. So may some gentle muse with lucky words favor my destined urn. Uh, lucky meaning happy, favorable words. The muse, of course, is, the, is a poet. Some gentle muse with lucky words favor my destined urn. And as he passes, turn and bid fair peace to my sable shroud, black the garb of mourning. And that is exactly what the what the, the form of the elegy seeks to do, to bid fair peace to the mourner, to the one in the black shroud. And of course, we'll see that however successful the, the poem does move from a black shroud to something else at the very end. And so notice the movements here. Now the speech, speech address is, is moving to justification. Why should he, why should the muses help? For we, the speaker in Lycidas, were nursed upon the selfsame hill. Now we're in the world of pastoral elegy, but this selfsame hill was, was Cambridge. So it's got this pastoral allegorical world, and then it's got this analogous real world. And the real world is, of course, that they were nursed upon the same college. They were there. Uh, students fed the same flock, now back into the pastoral, by fountain, shade, and rill. Together both, ere the high lawns appeared under the opening eyelids of the morn, we drove afield, and both together heard what time the grey fly winds her sultry horn. So stopping here, both poets of Cambridge, but both shepherds, pastors, in a way. And notice this beautiful metaphor of mourning. So they too were together on the hills under the opening eyelids of the morn. This comes from the book of Job, and it's a strange illusion. Most of the biblical illusions here are very strange. Job 41, 18, the description of the Leviathan, the monster of the deep, which gets a passing reference almost towards the end. Uh, the book of Job describes Leviathan's eyelids like the eyelids of the morning. Striking Hebrew metaphor here, but what it's doing is it's it's drawing suggestively upon the illusion Tapping into that cultural consciousness that really understood and were intimate with these passages of scripture and calling forth these oceanic images um, That aren't explicitly named within this pastoral world, but of course are 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 working on a subterranean level it's already thinking about the, the ocean, but but not really 
We drove afield, in both together heard what time the grey fly wins her sultry horn, the noon or afternoon, battening our flocks with the fresh dews of night, oft till the star that rose at evening bright toward heaven's descent had sloped his westering wheel. So what time the may that means when. When the when the grey fly uh, winds its sultry horn, you can hear the buzzing of the fly. It's all very textured within this pastoral world, and of course this this lovely phrase, this epithet, the western wheel, the western moving sun. Meanwhile, the rural ditties were not mute. The songs, pastoral songs, usually played upon the oaten flute, tempered to the oaten flute, rough satyrs danced, and fawns with cloven heel from the glad sound would not be absent long, and old Demetus loved to hear our song. So remembering, recalling that the act of recollection, very important for the elegy, the speaker is recalling the past existence with Lycidas, how they both were friends and how they both were shepherds and how the world around them rejoiced at their music. And notice this negative. Instead of saying the ditties were sounding or something like that, he says we're not mute. And so it's got this apophatic or negative descriptor because it is mute now as the turn you see this beginning to turn upon this hinge, but oh, the heavy change, now thou art gone. Now this is an address to Lycidas, finally. And he'll end in the second to last verse paragraph with the final address to Lycidas. But notice the heavy change, now thou art gone. And notice the passion here. Barbara Lewowski, who writes beautifully about this poem, called it a stunning fusion of intense feeling and consummate art. And we have this, this intense feeling here, that the passionate outcry, uh, in comparison to the difference of what's remembered and what is now. But oh, the heavy change, now thou art gone. Now thou art gone. Another epanalepsis here. Notice how that's working to reinforce the feeling movements, transits of passion upon which this poem hinges and never must return. The feeling of that absence now comes upon the speaker. Thee, shepherd, thee the woods and desert caves, with wild thyme and the gadding vine o'ergrown. Gadding was the sprawling or the, the overgrowing vine, and all their echoes mourn. The willows and the hazel copses green shall now no more be seen fanning their joyous leaves to thy soft lays. Notice the, the tranquility there with the elves. Willow, hazel, shall no more be seen. Leaves and lays. There's a softness here within the texture of the melodies. The O's, O's and O's and copses. The O and copses. Joyous. Yeah, it's got this texture that's weaving beauty with this passionate grief. So this reflection upon the absence of what is no more, and now he moves into a comparison. Three comparisons here are set up to Lycidas, beautifully set up in all pastoral comparisons. As killing as the canker to the rose. The canker was a uh, type of caterpillar that ate roses. As killing as the canker to the rose, or taint worm, to the weanling herds that graze. Taint worm was a, was a type of uh, parasite that some calves and sheep would pick up from eating grass. Or frost to flowers doth their gay wardrobe wear when first the white thorn blows. Such, Lycidas, thy loss to shepherd's ear. Now notice, heavy change and thy loss. The poem, again, is very interested in what is lost, what is gained. Wordsworth's Tintern Abbey was tapping into this a bit. We'll see loss uh, comes in that poem as well. And Wordsworth, of course, is drawing on Milton. But this heavy change in this loss is really the subject of this verse paragraph. And now he moves in almost in the act of accusation, this speech act now addressing the nymphs, which were sea spirits. Where were ye, nymphs? when the remorseless deep closed o'er the head of your loved Lycidas. Of course, drawing on Virgil's eclogues, the, the nymphs figure there. 
For neither were ye playing on the steep where your old bards, the famous Druids, lie. That was in Ireland. Remember, King died upon the Irish seas. So he's weaving classical mythology in with this Celtic native mythology. Where your old bards, the famous Druids, lie. Nor on the shaggy top of Mona high. Shaggy top of Mona. This was Anglesey, a prior poet talked about Anglesey being overgrown with oaks. And this is perhaps a reference to that. That was Michael Drayton. Nor yet where Deva spreads her wizard stream. This would be the River Dee, an English river. Ay me, I fondly dream had ye been there. For what could that have done? What could the muse herself that Orpheus bore? The muse herself for her enchanting son whom universal nature did lament. Speaking about Orpheus, after his failed attempt to recover Eurydice, he goes into mourning, he shuns the love of women, and yet he befell an awful fate. When by the rout that made the hideous roar, his gory visage down the stream was sent, down the swift Hebrus to the lesbian shore. He's saying, ah, what good it would it have been for you to be there? Because even Orpheus could not have been saved. Orpheus, because he was shunning the love of women, grieving for Eurydice, whom he couldn't bring back from Hades. The Thracian women were in love with him, but he wouldn't have sex with him, so they tore him to pieces and threw his head in the river. And that's what's meant by this gory visage down the stream was sent, down the swift Hebrus River to the Isle of Lesbos, to the lesbian shore. And so if Orpheus, the great singer, the great poet, the great tragic figure, could not be saved by the nymphs, then I fondly dream, had ye been there, for what could that have done? Fondly means foolishly. And notice these, these, these questionings. Gordon Teske, in his book, the, the Poetry of John Milton, has a beautiful chapter on this, on this poem, in which he really highlights, among other things, the intense, passionate, perilous questionings that inhabit this poem. Where were you? What could that have done? What could the muse herself have done to save or Orpheus? I mean, it's, it's all about these questions, and it's seeking in a way to finally resolve them all. And he says, alas, he gives up. Notice the way it's thinking, the moving with the thoughts of grief. I mean, this is exactly the way grief plays out in the human experience, in the mind. It's, it's blame, it's denial. And we'll find that there's paradoxical denial in this poem. Uh, trying to work its way to consolation. Alas, what boots it with incessant care to tend the homely, slighted shepherd's trade, and strictly meditate the thankless muse? What boots are prophets? What profits it to tend to the shepherd's trade, to sing, to write poetry about it? Now this first paragraph is very interested in reward. What is the gain? We've talked about the loss, the heavy change. What is the recompense? Were it not better done as others use to sport with Amaryllis in the shade? Use here being frequent. Were it not better done as others used to do to sport with Amaryllis in the shade or with the tangles of Nara's hair? And now this reflection. Fame is the spur that the clear spirit doth raise, that last infirmity of noble mind to scorn delights and live laborious days. Of course, fame is the last infirmity of the noble mind. It's the spur that the pure spirit, the clear spirit, doth raise to scorn delights and live laborious days. Of course, this linked in rhyme significantly. But the fair guerdon, our reward, another word for reward, when we hope to find and think to burst out in sudden blaze, comes the blind fury with the abhorred shears and slits the thin-spun life. Against all the labor of scorning delights for the sake of fame, of immortality, what's the reward? Blind fury, who was one of the fates of Tropos, who was blind and would cut the life threads of mortals indiscriminately, that's those abhorred shears, and slits the thin-spun life. So it's, it's all meaningless because fury will come and cut the life that we've spent so much on gaining fame for. And then we have this divine inter intervention, but not the praise, Phoebus replied and touched my trembling ears. 
Ah, he's received a correction from the god, and this is a contact with the classical god. Phoebus touched my trembling ears, and of course this word trembling, very important for the lyric mode, elegiac mode, because the strings of the lyre are trembling just as the voice is, as the tension in the language is. This is also calling back to a moment in Virgil when Apollo uh, comes into the poem suddenly to correct Virgil and tweaks his ear. Here Phoebus is tweaking the poet's ear, correcting him, but not the praise. Fame is no plant that grows on mortal soil, nor the glistering foil set off to the world. Notice how I said this poem is very interested in shaking away the things that will fall through death, through time, and identifying what will remain. Fame is not that plant that grows on mortal soil. It's not an earthly thing. It's, it's not the glistering foil set off the world. Now the glistering foil, if you had a diamond or a jewel, you often would set it upon a, a, a foil so that it would shine against it uh, to, to display it. And it's not like this, nor in broad rumor lies, but lives and spreads aloft by those pure eyes and perfect witness of all judging Jove. See, that's the bit that's hanging on immutably, is that the all judging God, Jove, sees all good things and holds all good things and preserves that. And so that the true fame will not fall away because it's in the eyes of all judging Jove as he pronounces lastly on each deed of so much fame in heaven, expect thy meed, expect your reward in heaven, not on earth. So again, the divine correction here is saying, do not look upon temporal things the way things seem, look ahead, because the reward is there and not within this world. Again, another shaking that discriminates between the passing and the eternal. So notice that this does provide some consolation. It's, it's leaning into a consolatory mode, but the consolation is not sufficient. It's not sufficient just to say that, well, Jove sees everything and keeps everything. It, the poem must go on. It must continue to work out this grief. O oh, fountain Arethus, and thou honored flood. O oh, fountain Arethus, this was the, the spring in Sicily often mentioned in pastoral poetry, so it's associated with that mode. This seems like an abrupt shift, by the way. Phoebus has come in, tweaked the ears of the poet, touched his trembling ears, corrected him, and then the poet's turning, O fountain artitus, and thou honored flood, smooth sliding Mencius, crowned with vocal reeds. Mencius refers to Virgil's hometown, or at least his birthplace, Mantua. Again, it's another dive into the pastoral elegy, this, this mode. That strain I heard was of a higher mood, the higher mood being what was spoken of Phoebus. But now my oat proceeds. Now he's going in, he's singing himself, making music himself. Now my oat, that's the oaten reed upon which the shepherds would play, proceeds and listens to the herald of the sea that came in Neptune's plea. This would be Triton. And he's going to come and ask another question. Triton, the god of the sea, he asked the waves and asked the felon winds. What hard mishap hath doomed this gentle swain? What happened to Lycidas? He's asking the winds and the waves. And questions every gust of rugged wings that blows from off each bleaked promontory. They knew not of his story. The winds and the waves do not know what happened to Lycidas. They cannot tell, Triton. And so, and sage Hippotates, their answer brings, the god of the winds. Doesn't know either, he brings the same answer, that not a blast was from his dungeon strayed. The air was calm, and on the level brine, sleek Panope with all her sisters played, another nymph. And so, what caused his death? If the winds and waves were not boisterous, if sleek Panope was playing with her sisters upon the calm brine, on the level brine and calm air, what occasioned the death? It was that fatal and perfidious bark, built in the eclipse and rigged with curses dark, that sunk so low that sacred head of thine. Again, ending here with this address to Lycidas, finally. 
What is the fatal and perfidious bark? Some scholars point to Roman Catholicism, perhaps, maybe the Church of the Antichrist. Others, and I think this makes sense, is listed as its body, and the eclipse is a figure for the curse of Adam, which was not just the toil, but also to die. So in a way, it was the body doomed to die, built in the eclipse, or under the shade of Adam's curse and the original sin. That's what's to account for death, in Milton's theological world, it was the transgression of Adam in death which must undergo the body or the bark. Bark is another name for uh, an ark or a boat, usually a small boat, and so this I think is a figure of the body. Where before we saw figures of the classical world, now we have native figures. We have this, the river Cam, which flows through Cambridge. Next Camus, reverend sire, went footing slow his mantle hairy, and his bonnet sedge, inwrought with figures dim, and on the edge, like to that sanguine flower, inscribed with woe. The river Cam comes up, dressed in his academic bonnet and gown, inwrought with figures dim, like a hyacinth, the sanguine flower, a flower for mourning, and he asks the same question Triton did. Ah, who hath reft my dearest pledge, who has taken away Lycidas, my dearest pledge, our child, our vowed child. Except Camus has more right to ask the question, whereas Triton just discovered him upon the sea, Cam notices his absence. And, and the classical world in the previous paragraph it had no answers. They did not know. The waves, the wind did not know. Hippotates, Panope, they did not know. Camus asks, what happens? Ah, who hath reft, quoth he, my dearest pledge? Last came and last did go, the pilot of the Galilean lake. So now we've seen figures come in and leave. Camus comes, asks the question, the last person to come is this pilot of the Galilean lake. Who is this pilot? Two massy keys he bore of metals twain, the golden opes, the iron shuts amain. He shook his mitred locks and stern bespake. There is some controversy over who this figure is, uh, the, the pilot of the Galilean lake. Some critics think that this is Christ himself coming. Uh, he was the one who guided the, the ship on the stormy sea of Galilee. Uh, when he was crossing with his disciples. Revelation has him bearing the two keys of death and hell. Uh, the book of 1 Peter describes him as a bishop, which would, uh, the bishop of the church, which would go in with this idea of the mitred locks. Locks was hair, mitre was a bishop's hat. So perhaps this is Christ? Many critics think it's more likely that this is Saint Peter, actually. And there's a few reasons for that. In Matthew 16, he was given uh, the keys to heaven and hell by Christ. He also was uh, considered to be the Bishop of Rome. So this is quite possibly St. Peter. He also was a fisherman. So this idea of him being a pilot on the Galilean lake makes sense. Christ does make an appearance towards the end. But I think this here is, is certainly Peter. This pilot asks, How well could I have spared for thee, young swain? Enow of such as for their bellies' sake creep and intrude and climb into the fold. Enow means enough. Kind of an archaic way of saying that. King Henry V says this in Shakespeare's play. We are enow to do our country loss. We're enough to make them suffer our loss. How well I could have spared thee. Enough of such that for their bellies' sake creep and intrude and climb into the fold. What's he criticizing here? Pastors who creep and intrude and climb into the fold. Many of the warnings in the Gospels warn against uh, those who try to sneak in some other way into the marriage feast or uh, wolves that creep into the fold. This is often a way to describe when priests or bishops or church leaders are not holding fast to their commitment to the flock. And this is another reason why this seems like it's St. Peter, because in, in Peter's letter, the second letter, he addresses prelacy as well. Of other care they little reckoning make than how to scramble at the shearer's feast and shove away some worthy bidden guest. 
So he's now making a critique against the church, not the church as the church, but the polity of the church, those ruling in the church uh, who are only interested in fleecing the sheep. Blind mouths, strange phrase, that scarce themselves know how to hold a sheep hook, or have learned aught else the least. Pretty harsh criticism, blind mouths. John Ruskin hypothesizes that this is a reference to bishops and pastors. A bishop was an overseer, so someone who sees. A pastor is one who feeds, and so blind mouths just kind of draws attention to the lack of Episcopal uh, work and pastoral care. You don't know how to hold a sheep hook that to the faithful herdman, herdsman's art belongs. What wrecks it then? What profits it them? What need they? They are sped. And when they list their lean and flashy songs, great on their scrannel pipes of wretched straw, the hungry sheep look up and are not fed, but swollen with the wind. Just to stop here. Again, in the world of the pastoral, which fits perfectly with the metaphors and the lexicon of the church, these false pastors, literally, uh, shepherds here, they like their lean and flashy songs, but they don't feed the sheep, so they like oratory, rhetoric. This is perhaps a Puritan critique of artificial language used in the pulpit. Preachers who wanted to show off their learning instead of actually explain what the scriptures say. So they don't feed, they sit there and sing on their scrannel pipes, discordant pipes of straw. These are not the oaten pipes of beautiful poetry. And the hungry sheep look up and are not fed. But swollen with wind and the rank mist they draw, rot inwardly and foul contagion spread. So sheep would actually get sick from eating uh, grass with dew on it. This is a reference here. They would get swollen and uh, they would get a rottenness inside and it would make them sick. Partly what's being referenced here. Besides what the grim wolf with privy paw daily devours apace. Of course, wolves are a threat to sheep, but also allegorically, this could mean the Jesuits who were, were picking off uh, English Protestants and making converts out of, out of them. Uh, legend has it that Andrew Marvell was one of these who converted to Catholicism under the influence of a Jesuit, ran away to London, and his Puritan father had to drag him back. Um, this happened at a very young age, and of course he didn't stay Roman Catholic. But this perhaps is what's mentioned here, Jesuits, Catholic priests, the order that was formed to combat Protestantism, so part of the Counter-Reformation. So these wolves, whoever they are, devouring the flock one by one, and nothing said. They do nothing. But that two-handed engine at the door stands ready to smite once, and smite no more. Of course, he ends here with this couplet. The two-handed engine is of much discussion among critics. They don't really know what this means. It's strange. It's very likely that the two-handed engine uh, represents France and Spain, who were allied in their Roman Catholicism, and always seemed a threat to England to Protestant England specifically. So perhaps it's that, but something's there at the door waiting to smite. Perhaps sin itself, as it appears in Genesis at the door, waiting to devour. Something stands ready to smite and the pastors are doing nothing. Now in the next verse paragraph, St. Peter, well, the pilot of the Galilean Sea falls silent. And then the elegiac voice, the poet, re uh, addresses Alpheus, uh, the river. Return, Alpheus, the dread voice is past that shrunk thy streams. So it's as if Alpheus withdrew when he heard St. Peter coming. Of course, Alpheus is mentioned in a lot of pastoral poetry, but it also has this connotation with someone who drowned. Uh, the Roman emperor Hadrian uh, fell in love with, with someone who died, who was drowned on the, the Nile River, much like Lycidas, who, who died in the Irish seas and then associated his lover's name with Alpheus. And so when they celebrated Alpheus, they celebrated, they commemorated rather, uh, the death of, of Hadrian's lover. And so this is, this is another subtextual, subsonic reference uh, that's working with the grain of this poem. So he's calling them to return. 
return Sicilian muse, and call the vales, and bid them hither cast their bells and flowerets of a thousand hues. Now call the land into mourning. So he's returning, he's, he's invoking Alpheus and the Sicilian muse to help him call the land, specifically the flowers, as we'll see, to mourn Lycidas. Ye valleys low, where the mild whispers use of shades and wanton winds and gushing brooks, on whose fresh lap the swart star sparly looks. Throw hither all your quaint enameled eyes. Enameled means decorated. He's calling all the flowers to mourn, that on the green turf suck the honeyed showers. Uh, suck the honey music. This comes from Hamlet. Uh, so he's perhaps borrowing there. Of course, Hamlet is a, is a play about mourning, about the loss. So in Hamlet, who's stuck in mourning. Call the green turf, suck the honeyed showers, and purple all the ground with vernal flowers. And here we have, I think, the one and only couplet of feminine, our weak rhymes. We have a double rhyme, showers and flowers. Bring the wraith primrose that forsaken dies, the tufted croto and pale jessamine, the white pink and the pansy freaked with jet. Freaked means streaked. The glowing violet, the musk rose, and the well-attired woodbine, with cowslip swan that hang the pensive head, and every flower that sad embroidery wears. Again, this habit, you know, the sable mantle, uh, the hairy mantle of Camus, the sad embroidery of flowers. It's, it's, it's this desire to invest the, the material world, the organic world, with spiritual sensibilities. Bid Amaranthus all his beauty shed, and daffodillies fill their cups with tears. Daffodillies was a colloquial, a rural, rustic way of saying daffodils. So he's drawing on the native flora here. But uh, there is some irony, as some critics have noted here, because daffodils are joyful flowers usually. Um, Robert Herrick has his, his flower that's, that's joyful, but it represents death. Wordsworth will later have his daffodils, and I wandered lonely as a cloud. So it's strange to consider a daffodil as one that's wearing sad embroidery, because it's not. But it's turning that image upside down, saying, fill their cups with tears, and so the glad faces of the flowers become receptacles for mourning to strew the laureate hearse where Lycid lies. And here's the wish, and here's how the poem is really addressing the absence of Lycidas's corpse. It's not just that he's died, it's also that there's no body to mourn. There is no laureate hearse to strew flowers upon. For so to interpose a little ease, let our frail thoughts dally with false surmise. I think this is what he's getting at here, this imagined celebration and commemoration. Of course, now he's honing in on the English tradition because all of this is very reminiscent. It's recalling uh, Edmund Spencer's the, Sh the Shepherd's Calendar, all the flowers of the calendar year and how they're, they're attired. So you've got the, the native landscape, but also the, the native uh, topography of literature being invoked. I me, whilst thee the shores and sounding seas wash far away, where'er thy bones are hurled, whither beyond the stormy Hebrides, that was Scotland, where thou perhaps under the whelming tide visits the bottom of the monstrous world, or whether thou, to our moist vows denied, tearful prayers, moist vows, sleepst by the fable of Belarus old. Um, Belarium was this imagined place, at the world's end. So he's addressed the fact that he's not there. This is a false fancy, a false surmise that he can strew the hearse because there is not there. Wherever it is, wherever Lycidas lies, perhaps here, perhaps there, perhaps where the great vision of the guarded mount looks towards Namancos and Bayona's hold. The great vision of the guarded mount, perhaps Camden, which was which was fabled to be visited by Saint Michael, the archangel. Look homeward, angel, now, and melt with ruth, or melt with grief and sorrow. And of course, this comes from Chaucer's Troilus and Crusade. Melt with ruth. 
calling on the angel. He's not actually talking to Lycidas. This is sometimes read as an address to Lycidas. And, O ye dolphins, waft the hapless youth. Calling on the animal life. Of course, dolphins, dolphins have a mythic significance here. They're often figured uh, in association with, with gods or with a certain uh, divine vocation. The dolphins appear in an interesting way in the Pythian hymn to Apollo, in the Homeric hymns, very ancient hymns. So they have a presence here as being divine, invested with mythical significance. Now notice this turn moving into this line. It's going to get into oceanic imagery with the ocean bed. We've seen it here with this imagining, but this is really contrasting with this, the fields of flowers, the, the English flowers of the landscape. Now, as Gordon Teske mentions in his book, Milton wants us to feel the oceanic loss of Lycidas. Weep no more, woeful shepherds, weep no more, for Lycidas, your sorrow, is not dead. Oh, this is surprising. A sudden turn. How, how can this be true, paradoxically? Notice these O's. Weep no more, woeful O and sorrow, enacting that sound of pain. Sunk though he be, beneath the watery floor. So sinks the day star in the ocean bed, and yet anon repairs his drooping head and tricks his beams, and with new spangled oar flames in the forehead of the morning sky. Beautiful image of grandeur here. The consolation is resurrection. He is not dead. He is like the day star, the star that sinks into the ocean and then comes back, repairs his drooping head, and lifts again. Drooping, Walt Whitman will pick this up in his elegy to Walt, uh, Abraham Lincoln, when he says, in the great star early drooped in the western sky and the night. Uh, he's tapping into this language from Lycidas, this elegiac language. The sun sinks into the ocean bed, and then comes back with new spangled ore, flames in the forehead of the morning sky. Really beautiful, delicate personification, Spencerian, lightly so. But notice this so. This is a comparative so, comparing Lycidas' death with the fall of the star, of the sun, really, into the ocean bed and then rising again. This is a logical, uh, therefore, a conclusive so. So Lycidas sunk low, but mounted high through the dear might of him that walked the waves. Ah, here comes Christ. Not the pilot, the navigator of a boat, but as a walker upon the waves. It's unmistakable who this is. Through his dear might, where other groves and other streams along, with nectar pure his oozy locks he laves. And here's the unexpressive nuptial song in the blessed kingdoms, meek of joy and love. So where is Lycidas now? He's mounted high, like that sun in the forehead of the morning sky. He's laving his wet hair as oozy locks in the groves of paradise, in the blessed kingdoms, meek of joy and love. And notice how the extreme isolation of the imagined dead corpse of Lycidas at the bottom of the ocean is exchanged. I mean, the ocean is the deepest place you can go on earth, is exchanged by this, not even an oceanic reach, but an ethereal reach all the way to the blessed kingdoms. And so he begins in this isolation deep down, finally with his communion high above. There entertain him all the saints above in solemn troops and sweet societies that sing, and singing in their glory, move and wipe the tears forever from his eyes. And here's where I think really the poem achieves this consolation, is, is that, that reach, that contrasting reach, and the accompanying of the saints and the sweet societies. Now, Lycidas, the shepherds weep no more. So the call at the beginning of this paragraph, weep no more, woeful shepherds. The call has been fulfilled. We're to understand that this consolation achieved it. It's to be found in the Christian resurrection. So the classical world couldn't 
bring an answer of even why he died or how to be consoled about his death. But it must come from Christianity, from this resurrection. Henceforth thou art the genus of the shore. A genus was a local spirit. So he is, he's kind of the guardian spirit of the shore. In thy large recompense, and shalt be good to all that wonder in the perilous flood. So Lycidas first dies, imagine at the bottom of the ocean, now revealed to be in the sweet societies of the saints, and then also transmuted in a way into the genus loci, into the, the genus of the shore, and in thy large recompense. So again, recompense, uh, what has been exchanged. He lost much in death, but his state has been recompensed even greater. And this large recompense is, of course, what Wordsworth is drawing on when he says abundant recompense. Not for this faint eye, nor more, nor murmur, other gifts have followed. That is his abundant recompense. Here too, Lycidas has become the genus of the shore, and shalt be good to all that wander in the perilous flood. So it's, it's as though, what's interesting is he could have ended here, right, could have ended here, but he had to add this. You have to ask why. It's not enough that Lycidas is happy where he is because we are still here in the here and now on earth, in the material world, dealing with the loss. We do not share in that abundant recompense or that large recompense that Lycidas enjoys. But for him to be made the genus of the shore seems to provide some need, it seems to answer some need present in England for those left behind. That that his death shall be a good somehow, that this evil has been turned for good for those even behind and not just for him. And then here's the beautiful ending. Thus sang the uncouth swain to the oaks and rills. So thus the song ends of the shepherd, the uncouth swain, while the still morn went out with sandals gray. He touched the tender stops of various quills with eager thought, warbling his Doric lay. What's happening there? The quills, remember the oaten reed? Well, the stops are those holes where you put your fingers. So he's been singing, he's been playing music. And now the sun had stretched out all the hills and now was dropped into the western bay. So the sun rises in the morning, makes his trek across the sky and drops in the western bay. But we don't mind that because we know that this sun, as described in the previous stanza, though it sinks into the ocean, will rise again. And notice this turn, at last he rose, not the sun, but the uncouth swain. And it's this, at last he rose. It's describing how the shepherd who has been sitting there all day singing gets up. But this getting up, this bodily rising, is of course suggestive, is looking up too the day of the resurrection. So you have the sun dropping and you have the uncouth swain rising. They notice the motion of that. At last he rose and twitched his mantle blue. Tomorrow to fresh woods and pastures new. This, the swain can rise because he knows Lycidas will. And so the poem can conclude. Peter Sachs in his wonderful book on the English elegy if you love elegies, you should read that. He has a beautiful chapter on Lycidas. And he asked the question, why mantle blue? And part of his answer had to do with, it's an exchange of the sable shroud that the, the swain was dressed in before, or that he imagines he's dressed in as he's mourning at the urn. And the sad embroidery of all the flowers, all of this dress and habit of mourning is now exchanged. He twitched his mantle blue, shook it. Tomorrow to fresh woods, and pastures new. What the poem has enabled the uncouth swain, all of us, to do is to get up and rise and meet the next day and to meet the future. And this is what the elegy seeks to achieve. It enables us to move on, enable us to exchange the sable shroud for a mantle blue with the assurance that one day Lycidas will rise again, enabling the uncouth swain to rise. Wonderful poem, so much here I didn't mention. 
But hopefully, I hope this gave you an insight into just how beautiful the poem is, what it means, and how Milton is, is using the English language. Thanks everyone for watching, and until next time.